wide shot I'm supposed to sit in like Yeah, this. wide shot. I like so that. I, I figured the wide shot would work a little bit better. Well, I think it captures more of a... More of the feel or the ambiance. Yeah, it captures the ambiance of the room. And I almost need to pull this up just a little bit. That way, it's actually, I can, I can right. see we it. Can, we can look. We can look eye yeah, to eye. Yeah, we can look eye to eye. Right. So, um, anyways, welcome. This is Philosopher Poet. Uh, this is uh, week number two. This is my first in interview. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Mr. Mike Ciccone. 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 Uh, Northern Italian has some H's that aren't there. My grandpa was born uh, about 20 minutes north of Pisa. So Shikoni, even though it's, really? it's C-E-C-C-O-N-I, he was born an American citizen. His family went back over to deal with an inheritance thing, you know, 1915, 1920, whatever, whenever, whenever my grandfather was gestating. And they went over to deal with a family thing, and even though he was born an American citizen, because his mother was naturalized and all that, he was actually born during an earthquake in a small mining village about 20 minutes north of Tuscan, uh, of uh, Pisa in Tuscany. Wow. That's why I'm, I'm a pale-skinned Italian. Pale even, skin though, Italian. even though I'm hairy and, and, and dark-eyed and dark You really hair. got the hair going for you. Yeah, I, I don't really have any of the, the swarthiness of Italian because I'm, I'm, my, my people are from the Alps. Yeah, we'll do, we'll do the eyes favor and you won't be like ripping off oh, the yeah. shirt. Yeah, it's, yeah, we'll see how the interview goes. Want. But anyways, we're, we're here interviewing Mike Ciccone. Ciccone. Uh, Ciccone. I like this banter. This is good. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. So we're interviewing him today. Uh, I'll, I'll just say Mike. Works right. for me. Mike. Uh, he is a poet, part of the Yuka Poet Society. Also has done a number of different things uh, across the country. And you did some work in Los Angeles. I, I would, uh, in a different phase of my life, I was a production assistant out in L.A. for a number of years. Mostly worked for Kevin Smith's uh, film company. If, if you're ever watching Clerks 2 at 3 in the morning and you see a fat guy in a Hawaiian shirt standing behind Wanda Sykes, that's, um, that's, that's my mainstream exposure. Being I always pulled. wanted to interview a guy in a Hawaiian shirt that pulled. was in Clerks 2. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, you know it's, it's when you're working film sets, sometimes you accidentally very briefly become an actor. I've done TED Talks. I've done... Um, so you're mainly a writer. I'm mainly a writer, uh, not just poetry. I've been mainly focusing on poetry and stand-up comedy lately, but I've joined a short story writing group. I have to finish my novel about the last Sasquatch on Earth one of these days, so I've been trying to remind myself how to do prose. Yeah, wait till they have the last Sasquatch on Earth before you do yeah, it. Yeah, exa exactly. Right, exactly. you know, make a ceremony. Exactly. So I'd like to get started just with, uh, you know, how do you get started in writing? Um, what, what's your background with, uh, with getting into that, that realm? Well, when I was a little boy, I wanted to draw newspaper comic strips. I've always wanted to be a writer of some kind, mm -hmm. but my whole life I've been kind of evolving with what happens and what works. And then sort of in my childhood, I sort of realized I can't draw very well. So then I wanted to be a journalist for a while. I was on my, I was ahead of my high school newspaper. I went to some things and then I realized like, hey, you have to do a bunch of reporting before you get to be the funny op-ed columnist, which is what I wanted to do. I wanted to be the guy who like, you know, wrote like the, the humor column about modern society and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and newspapers started dying when I was in college mm -hmm. anyway. Uh, so I switched into film school. I got a degree in, in uh, screen, screenwriting, um, technically television radio film from the Newhouse School at Syracuse. Uh, 15 something years later, I still owe them about 12 grand. Uh, so I, I, uh, my formal writing training is more in screenwriting, uh, but I mean, I've always been a writer. My father was a writer when I was 13 and a confused kid. My dad put Kurt Vonnegut novels in my hands and said, hey, absorb these, these will help you. And, uh, you know, I read a lot of speculative fiction, soft science fiction, Philip K. Dick. As I got older, uh, right. like a lot of, um, you know, uh, sort of esoteric nonfiction, your Hunter S. Tom, you know, a lot if of kids. If I remember correctly, you actually were a religion major also. I was, I, my minor was comparative religion, yes. Yeah. My minor was comparative religion because... At the film school I went to at Newhouse, everyone had to take a minor outside of communications. Right. Because, you know, of course, 
uh, in school. Like, you need a guy to communicate. Something. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Because like everybody, everybody, you know, if I, in TV, radio, film, we would have just minored in broadcast journalism mm-hmm. in the same department if they'd let us. But you know the ethos of liberal arts education. Um, they, they said take a minor outside outside your field in the arts and sciences. So I um, saw everyone else copping out and being an English minor mm-hmm. because they're like, oh, it's writing. Part of what I'm doing is this screenwriting training. And I'm the kind of jerk who has to be a little bit contrary. So I stepped back and I thought, well, what other kinds of things are about reinforcing my storytelling in the arts and sciences? And I just kind of decided... What's what were the first stories, but religious stories, you know? Absolutely. And so I, uh, and as as a person who was a very uh, vocally lapsed Catholic, it was uh, it was it was. I like that term, vocally lapsed Catholic. I like to say recovering Catholic, or I like to say that my Catholicism is re- in remission. Uh, comparing comparing Catholicism to diseases like chemical dependency and 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 wasting cancer type diseases it's, it's a good it's something that's always going to be in you but you might be able to keep in check for 70 or 80 years it's in deep under your skin now i um and and i could kind of be the the person in the religious studies classes who was it was always like 80 percent like actually very religious people 20 percent screaming atheists and then me the one agnostic sort of sort of right. in the, the split between and it was always it was it was fun it was rhetorically fun right now let's go into that a little bit so what's a work that you've written or you've done that kind of delved delved into the religiousity uh do you do you more dive into the, like the archetypical nature of religious writing, or what kind of ways to use religion? I like to. I, I I guess I like you know as 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 bad a rap as postmodernism has taken. Um, yeah, I, I, if you don't know, I hate postmodernism. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it, because it's overdone. I, I do feel that in. In Nothing sto- has meaning. Thus, we shouldn't even begin with stories. See, see, I, 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 I tend, I tend to believe that that deconstruction does have its place as long as it's not the end game. You know, deconstructionism is wonderful if you're breaking things down to try to build something back up. You know, and and I, I do like taking apart the the interplay between the historical truth of a thing and the religious truth of a thing. And really diving in deep, um, there's this quote from the movie Beetlejuice. Um, this quote from the movie Beetlejuice, where he says something that one of his one of his bona fides as as a bioexorcist, as someone who scares human beings away, is that he's seen The Exorcist 300 times, and it gets funnier every single time he reads it. And, and I feel the same way about the Book of Revelation. I sometimes I I, I Enjoy reading the book of Revelation, not as a book of religious predictions, but as a, just an absurdist, like, science fiction story from before there was a thing called, you know, there's like, there's like seven-headed beasts and, and, you know, just buckets of frogs being poured on the earth by angels, and it's like, it's wild, and it's psychedelic, and you can tell that it's somebody, you know doing mushrooms on an island in Greece in like 150 AD and he's just like processing his his hatred of the the Roman Empire through through drugs and just just esoteric writing and I love it I I, I like taking a um a, a deconstructive approach right you know I uh, you know I I have my my problems with religion but I also know that it's a very powerful thing, and it is our our first stories and our last stories are generally going to have some kind of religious undertones to them because we're trying to find a structure in our lives. You know, we're trying to find the through line of our own lives. We're trying to find you know Act One, Act Two, Act Three of our lives, and Act Three is death. It, no matter how long we live, no matter how how much good or bad we do, there does come an end. And there's the interplay of religion as a life story and a story as a story. And 
as much as I tend to be a non-believer in, in most things, I'm also not the kind of person who's like, you know, just because I haven't seen it doesn't mean it isn't there. You know, God might just think that I have bad breath. Uh, I may just, you know, we are living for like one eye blink of time in the furthest, dingiest corner of the universe. Divinity may well be out there, and it just don't got time for my little mayfly existence to say hi. And I'm, I'm cool with that. And, you know, you have to sort of look at life that way and look at writing that way. I'm, I'm, I'm heavily caffeinated. I'm enjoying this Tramontane ca- 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 Coffee Cafe. Yeah, I mean, and, uh, the, I'm a little rambly. My, I do apologize. Yeah, if, if the audience doesn't know, we're here at the Tramontane Cafe. This is actually on the second floor. Uh, this is what's known as the sunroom. There's, uh, I'll show you a picture later, but there's a huge giant sun in the room. And they also a chair in a closet, so you could literally have an interview in a closet if you wanted to. Yeah, it's 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 nice because the downstairs is a performance space and cafe that they have uh, upstairs here for for uh, for uh, the Bohemian the, Getaway. The Bohemian Getaway and the Hideaway, whichever Hideaway the Getaway. Getaway. Police are here. Yeah, exactly. It's it's a it's a um, it's a fallout shelter for uh, intellectual pursuits. Ivory Tower, maybe, but hey, not a lot of ivory in Utica. But yeah. yeah, so anyway. I'm sorry, I keep rambling. Here. No, no, it's fine. It's all good. So, uh, tell me a little bit about uh, your writing style. I Meaning, like, when you actually get pen and paper in hand, or computer and pa- mm-hmm. computer and uh, typing, uh, what's usually your your modus operandi for getting getting started? A lot of the time, honestly, I've developed over the years uh, a tendency to any time I had even a halfway decent idea, I just scribble it down somewhere, or I type it into Twitter, or I type it into Face, just somewhere where I can, even if it's just a turn of phrase, I like, mm. and and then I collate it, and I keep an I keep an online journal, and every day I'll have nine, ten, fifteen weird ideas or the beginning of a joke. Uh, Often my ideas start by just bombarding myself with media, listening to radio and a YouTube thing and a song, all at once, playing a video game, doing my own writing. I mishear something, and all of a sudden the mishearing is kind of fun. And I'll have a phrase, so then I'll, I'll save all those ideas every day, and then maybe once a week I'll go back through and I'll be like, you know, maybe, one out of every seven or eight of these ideas is anything interesting at all. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll take one of those. I'll take those ideas and I'll just put them on a clipboard or put them on you know text files on my computer, and I just leave them there to just stay. And I kind of I start to start seeing like, hey, this idea goes with that. I merge the files, and then all of a sudden they start turning into poems, or they turn into stand-up comedy bits, or they turn into the beginnings of a short story. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm sort of like, my creative process starts by forcing my brain to sort of be a, a, a mashup machine. You know, I, I try to mishear things. I try to look at ideas and how can I understand that word different. There's a, a flash fiction group I've been working with at the, the library in Little Falls where I live. And so Little Falls is in New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Over in New York, yeah. Well, uh, you mentioned Utica, so it's I... Very, well, yeah, so Utica is also not Ithaca. Th- this, this, is, yeah. this is a tundra. <laughs> we, ha- we have a tundra uh, just before flyover begins. There's a small tundra, and uh, we're, we're on that tundra. And Utica and Little Falls are, are places on the tundra. Uh, and what's, what's great about that flash fiction group is that we... Um, we just have a word every week, and I like you know, and you just have to write a five hundred page, uh, five hundred page, five hundred word short you have story. One word for each page. Right? One word, yeah. And, and and what's great is is just you look at the word and you're like, what's the other way I can take this word? You know, th- here's how this word could be meant to take, but what if I take it a different way? What if I, you know, willfully taking the opposite meaning or willfully taking the esoteric or strange meaning of the word instead of taking the intended one. I'm, I enjoy the idea of 
interrogating language because the great thing about the English language is it's a muck. It has words from all these different languages. The German ones are better though. The German ones are, are more terse. The German ones are more direct. But the great thing is, is we have, we'll have a German word and a French word and a Spanish word, and they'll all mean the same thing, but they'll all be copied into English, and they'll all have their different shade of that word. Nuances. They'll have that nuance, because at the end of the day, I mean, language is not a precision tool. Language is, is about evoking. Like, we all agree that the word cat is the word cat, and it means cat, and it's C-A-T. Right. But no matter how precise that is, you have a cat that shows up in your, even though you know that that word means all cats, in the language of your mind, you have a cat that is the first cat you picture. And for me, it's one of my childhood cats, Lily. She was a Maine Coon. She was uh, gray and black striped. She, in her old age, she had a series of small strokes that shriveled her ears up to look like Yoda. She could say tuna and salmon and trout when my father brought back fishing. And I know that the word cat means all cats. And it could mean a lion, it could mean a house cat, it could mean Garfield, it could mean any right. number of things. But at the end of the day, when I say cat, you have a slightly different cat in your head. And we're throwing all these words at a wall to try to make them all overlap until we can get this intense precision, but it's never going to be exactly what's transmitted from my mind to your mind, and we just keep, this is part of why I'm a long-winded person, is I try to over-explain and over-explain and over-explain because I do have this, this, this strong sense that one or two words will always fail, and I just keep trying to work that half-life down more and more to get closer and closer to saying the exact thing I want to say. It, it's uh, locking in asso association ideas, right? right. The, I, the concept that you have something in your head and then you keep associating it and it has some type of neural network, mm -hmm. right? Part of the problem is that if you're trying to get exact in a technical language, right, Poetry is not the language for that, right? But, but, but that's the flip side of it, is that poetry allows you to play around with that. It so, allows you to see what you're invoking and what you're evoking, but also leaving it... It's sort of like writing a short story that has an ambiguous ending, and somebody says to you, why didn't you well, write that's, it? Well, that story doesn't have an ambiguous ending for me. I know exactly how it ends. Well, that, and I mean, that's, that's the thing. That's my interpretation. Right, right. But some people, like in, in this, this uh, fiction group I've been working with, mm -hmm. some people will intentionally write a story where the ambiguity is the point of the ending, that you're leaving it to someone to imagine it. And some people are like, but I wish you would tell me what was in your mind for the ending. Mm -hmm. So the, the imprecision of language and the fight to get as precise as you can. And the flip side of it is, is being able to play around. Mm. Taking words like, like, like. Yeah, you, you know, remember, like, like, remember can my, like, my book of like. Yeah, you know, like can mean like, like can mean love. Like can mean a perfunctory thing that you put on a, on, on a social media posting. There's a, a character in the video game Legend of Zelda that's a like-like, and it's like a little accordion monster that eats your shield. I forgot about the like like and this and, the, and and you know what it's going to make one of my fans very happy that we we made a Legend of Zelda reference. I might have him watch this just to well, I, I mean, watch the that's, of Zelda. and that's part of what it comes down to too is is that people like to believe that there's high culture and there's low culture, and there isn't. There's culture, and you know, the the, the meaning of a reference to Legend of Zelda can mean as much as a reference to Kierkegaard, depending. <coughs> Depending on the context of what you're talking about, you're coughing during it. God's God's trying to strike you down for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but it depends on who you're speaking with, you know. Yeah, I mean, like, look, you know, it's uh, my my. It depends thing, on what point you're trying to make, too. Well, here's two things I'm going to say about high art and low art, right? Mm -hmm. Intentionality, mm -hmm. right? I think that's the biggest thing. I, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of people that like to say. Um, you know, a lot of the artists uh, in the postmodern era are, you know, putting a toilet in the middle of a, 
of an area and saying, well, that's art, right? Mm-hmm. Or, you know, the person showing themselves, whatever it is, right. that, that more avant-garde type art that's out there, right? My thing, I have two points on this. For mm-hmm. Number one is, this is for myself personally, okay. I don't know if you ever see in my writing, but sometimes I force myself to write in sonnet, I force myself to write in potamic amateur and mm-hmm. these other more stricter forms mm-hmm. because it's, okay, I'm going to show you that I can do the art form mm-hmm. in its most pure form, mm-hmm. and then from there I'm going to start breaking rules and start doing things within the constraints of what I'm doing, right? So that's one thing that I tend to do mm-hmm. because I have this, I don't know what we call it, inferiority complex or, uh, you know, trying to overcompensate. You got a chip but, on your shoulder. It's okay well, to say chip, you got a, you got a chip, chip on your shoulder. shoulder. Yeah. yeah, that's fine. You know, I'll call it that. But it's, it's also this idea that, you know, if I'm a Picasso and I'm saying, yes, I'm drawing this art, you know, uh, this cubism to make this shape or mm-hmm. this idea, that's mm-hmm. fine, right? Or if I'm uh, a Pollock and I'm, you know, throwing paint up on a wall and I'm, I'm mm-hmm. making the argument that I can do it because of precision, I'm not doing it because I can't do the actual, right. the art form, right? Mm-hmm. I'm doing it only because I'm making a very specific statement, right? right? And I think... I think this ties back into poetry, right? Right. In some ways, that sometimes, you know, and I, you know, the, you know, uh, an open mic night's not the time to be, you know, criticizing somebody's artwork, or right? Somebody's, or being like, hey, you know, your your slant rhyme here was a little off, or a little yeah. off, or right? Yeah. But um, when it comes down to, you know, poetry and and the work of it, mm-hmm. right? You have to have some medium for actually construing it. It's like trying to make Play-Doh without, you know, having a little crank machine. Yeah, you know? right. Because you you bring up a Picasso or, or or a Pollock, and their work seems so very different from other artists. But at the same time, they're still using a square easel and they're still using paints. Right. And on that level of form, all these artists are exactly the same. Because at the end of the day, no matter how different photorealism is from just absurdism just splashing a thing on there, you're still putting paint on a piece of canvas. Right. So, kind of, so dovetailing into this, in order to actually express art, <sighs> Okay, sorry about that. All right. So <laughs> no, it's, I, was, it's, I was always told that you have to put on airplane mode when you're doing doing these things. And right. Like, yeah. So sorry about that, guys. So no, no, it's it's this. But here's the thing. Like this is this is. Did you turn it back on? Is it still playing? Yeah, it's still playing. It's 22 see. minutes in. I can't. Yeah, see yeah, yeah, we're still I can't playing see from here. But no, like like this this example in and of itself is what we're talking about with with how form affects what you're doing. Like, the form of an interview video is pretty old. It goes back as far as as moving pictures. We have silent interview video with Mark Twain by Thomas Edison. But the, the, the form of this interview has been changed by the fact that now the camera's also a phone. And it could be interrupted by you getting a phone, a phone call on it. And it's very much the same thing to watch a sit-down interview on the Dick Cavett show in 1970, but like the the, the kineograph scopes that they were they were shooting those on, those film to video things, weren't gonna ring. You know? And now we can do this without a big studio. We can set up a nice camera phone in the upstairs of a wonderful little cafe. And we can do almost the same thing for nearly free. But now, you know, it might ring. And like, like, like that's, that's what I enjoy about, about form, too, is there was this um, book on um, comic book theory, actually, the theory of writing and, and drawing uh, graphic art called Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud. And some of the analogies he came up with were applied to all kinds of writing, to poetry, to anything, is that, you know, you have a jug, you have a clear jug, and it's got the Kool-Aid man on it because you got the jug as a send-in with Kool-Aid points and it's clear and you, you see a liquid in it and you just assume that the label on the jug is for the water but it's it's antifreeze in there and it looks like Kool-Aid because it's so we, we play with the form you know we see what 
the form of haiku or or sonnet does to our words. We right. see how we're the forms we choose shape our words. Uh, one of the things I explore uh, quite often with my writing lately is that you know being in um, smaller towns around here, you know, you find your outlets for your work where you can. And I have had a small amount of success turning some of my funnier poems into something of a hybrid between stand-up and poetry that I'd like to call stand-up poetry. You know, because it's a very... Sit-down pro- sit poetry would not really be that... Yeah, exactly. It gets the idea that I'm, I'm doing comic poetry in a, in a stand-up setting. And experimenting with how those two forms smash up against each other right. is really fun. Uh, something I said when I, I did a TED Talk a couple years ago about the value of, of comedy in society is, um, it again, it applies to all writing. You know, what's, what's very interesting to me is taking two ideas that people think are opposing and show how they work together mm. or taking two ideas that we think work together and, and showing how they're, they're completely ridiculous. Uh, one of the one of my earlier uh, stand up poetry poetry pieces. Um, stand up poetry poetry pieces. Yeah, because well, it's stand up poetry. Well, it started as, as a poem and it, it evolved into stand up poetry. Was was about um, uh, about uh, just how I don't understand golf and making it an analogy of how I don't understand golf for like like I'd never tell golfers they can't get married and. <laughs> And how, you know, just sort of... And then you, you go into... Bit building into the analogy yeah. of just, like, well, why don't you want to let your, your gay and bi friends get, like... I don't understand... I'm not attracted to other men, but I also don't understand golf. I I, I could probably see a world where, where you know, even though, my, even though my whole life I've only been attracted to women, I can see a higher chance of being attracted to, like, one man one day mm. than of... You know, putting on snooty clothes, going onto a great big field that could be used for corn to feed the homeless, and instead we let rich people pay five hundred dollars a day to kick a little ball around. I've gone thirty-eight years and only been attracted to women, but I, I think I could, if I lived forever, I'd be attracted to another man before I'd be. I could understand why one would golf. And but it's like about taking ideas like that and like take these two incredibly disparate weird ideas, smash them to be. Uh, it's it's like the um, God. It's like the uh, Hedron Super Collider. Mm. You know, you're taking subatomic particles and you're just smashing them against each other to see what little things come out. And so, writing like that is for is for me sometimes. Right. So just getting back to the form a little bit. I, just want I to like this because because you're taking you're taking philosoph- philosophic form and you're right. applying it to this. I, Hence philosophy. I, 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 I ah. see, you see, I see, I see where we're going with this. So if you look at form a little bit more, and kind of getting back to my point, it has purpose to it though, mm-hmm. right? It's not just the universe smashing ideas together, right. and throwing paint up on mm-hmm. on a canvas. Mm-hmm. This thing is really helpful, by the way. Yeah, yeah, it really is. It needs to put like a pulley something right back here. Yeah, yeah. So, well, this is but there's there's the example, and this is what I was trying to get get at before. Sorry. Uh, of a you might have a bid, right? That you know, a painter's been working on it, happens to have paint splashed mm-hmm. on it, right? Mm-hmm. And you you cut it out. Somebody you know made this example that you, okay, here is this Pollock, you know, and they they showed people like this is a Pollock, right? Mm-hmm. When it was really just a canvas of somebody's smock mm-hmm. that got cut out, right? And made people and put it in a frame, made people believe that it was art, right? Now, you wouldn't be able to have the same thing happen with Michelangelo, right? Right? Or you know, if you put a monkey to a typewriter, right? Or let's say even uh, I don't know if you've seen this before, but they have the uh, poetry generators. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That will you know automatically generate a poem, mm-hmm. right? One of the things about art that I think is important is that you there is some and even though artists create has a creative value, which is really hard to measure because of the nature of being created, mm-hmm. there has to be something to measure it. Right. Right? To say, this is a poem. But at the same time, we each have our own slightly different... 
Like it's it's weird that it's both objective and subjective. Well, that's that's the interplay, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, that, you know, that, that's what I'm talking about. I mean, I've looked at some of those poetry generators, and while they generate gibberish, sometimes they generate gibberish that then gives me an idea to actually do something interesting. Like there was this experiment similar. I don't play role playing games because I'm terrible at math. But I, and I, I don't want to sit around rolling dice all the time, and I'm a broke artist who can't necessarily always drive to join a game, but I'm fascinated with role-playing games because it's such a, it's such a storytelling form, right? They're, they're getting together and they'll pretend to be elves and dwarves and fighting dragons, but coming up with a story along the way. And there was this generator for like, where they just fed all of the spells and Dungeons and Dragons into a computer. And they said, okay, procedure to generate more spells. And, like, some of them were, like, completely ridiculous. But some of them were interesting, like chromatic wolf. Like, it would just turn you into a rainbow wolf? Would it shoot a rainbow of wolves? <laughs> like, I, I'd be interested for, for someone to, like, take that list of procedurally generated spells and, like, then, then you know take the interplay of the randomness and the intentionality, and then take that list to someone who actually writes the source books for the games and be like, take ten of these and actually make them into spells or monsters, you know? Like, I I love that. And you're right, there, there has to be an element of intention at the end of the day, whether by the reader or the writer or both, hopefully both, but at the, at the same time, it's fun to, to also incorporate that element of randomness, of smashing things. Well, that, that's what I say, you know, like my whole writing process is about I take the random things that come to my mind, and then I, I do sort through them, you know? I don't just take every, everything. It's like, oh, okay, this thing was interesting, you know, and then there's a text file on my computer. And then of the six things I might read in an open mic when I'm testing new material, like downstairs here at the tram, um, probably only one of those poems I feel is good enough to take and ever perform somewhere else again. But it's, it's this sift, it's this, it's this sifting, you know, it's, there, there's this pyramid of there's these ideas, and some of these ideas are good enough to try to do one thing with, mm -hmm. and then some of those ideas are, are good enough to do again, and then like a few of them are good enough to focus and rewrite and perform out and test, and then maybe actually turn into part of a formal performance. Or uh, like I did uh, the Rochester Fringe Festival where I just did a one-man show of poetry and comedy last year, and that was really great. Or or putting into a... The whole festival was just you. It no, was just yeah, Mike Sikoni. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I was, get out there, and it's Mike Sikoni. Yeah, you no, know, I was one person on, <laughs> on a little stage for 30 people, and next door was... Was I believe like two hundred people there for a screen? It's like you know, Rochester Fringe is actually really cool, but it's just like you know, it's just like a, a book thing, or you put them in a book, or you put them in a, a local poetry compendium or something. But like at the same time, you know, I I I love then taking all of this miasma of different influences and high culture and low culture and. Ephemera is something I'm really into, is the, the idea that the things you can really learn about a culture are the things they mean to be thrown away. You know, the history books are, are written down to glorify and uh, deify an age and what meant. But a hamburger wrapper that was meant to throw away, that was meant to just be a hamburger wrapper, and you look at that hamburger wrapper and you really understand what a culture is valuing. You really understand... Uh, uh, my, my younger brother was in town for a while and we were just going around we, we were collecting stuff from uh, defunct theme parks uh, Great Escape theme park up north of Albany used to be called Storytown and then it got expanded and roller coasters no and, more stories right, Well, there's, there's still a little storybook village but it's now like mostly roller coasters and water rides and and north of here, of Utica, in Old Forge, there's Enchanted Forest, Water Safari, but it used to just be Enchanted Forest, which just, you know, a few, like, carnival rides, and you walk through a thing where you listen to Peter Pan and the Three Little Pigs told in, like, 
you know, little animatronic, blah, 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 and after 30 years, they're talking like this. But and it's but it's cool and 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 like we're we're collecting ephemera from those things. Uh, where we're collecting, I really enjoy the things that are just manufactured for use and not thought of as an artifact of a great time, because that's what you really learn. There's this there's this kind of of, of glassware called siesta ware that was based on a well-collected kind of glass called Fiesta Ware. And they're these, these chintzy, like, barrels of brown glass with, like, a wooden handle on them. And they just screen print on Enchanted Forest or South of the Border, like, like weird, like, tourist traps. And, like, yeah. these are the things that were meant to be just bought and then disposed of in three months where you're like, why did I buy this from a fireworks stand in South Carolina? And they show up on the shelves of Goodwills and Salvation Armies. And, like, these are the things where you really learn about the past because there's no lie to it. It's just, an, it's, it's like infomercials, right? Infomercials are the last honest thing on television because their agenda is they want you to buy this turnip twaddler or whatever the hell they're selling. Yeah. They want you to buy the, the magic bullet. And, oh, boy, you know, it's like there's, there's, there's no lie to it. And it's not meant to be high art. Chef Tony is just, he isn't a chef and he probably isn't named Tony. He's an Italian guy who can grow out a mustache and put on a hat and sell knives. And that's just what he's doing. And like, if our society survives another few generations, that's what they're going to be really looking at to learn about us because like, Look you know, at the crap that we have to look, offer them. Uh, well, well, you know, well, it's it's dumpster diving, right? Well, but, well, like dumpster that. diving is where you find the honest thing, though. Right. Because, like, you know, whatever your political belief, there will be a bunch of books put out by people who say that what Donald Trump is doing is great. There's going to be a bunch of books put out by people who say that, that what Donald Trump is doing was awful. There will be a bunch of people putting out books... On the far left will be like what Donald Trump was doing was awful, but what Hillary Clinton would have been doing was worse. There are a lot of, a lot of people on the right who will be like what Donald Trump was doing was, was, was awful, but hey, maybe if we were doing it, but only at 35% like Mitt so, Romney would. So what you're saying is that all these people are putting out all these definitive things of intentional history, and they'll think that they'll be telling the story of our time, but you look at what things are listed in the ingredients on your your damn Big Mac, and okay, how so they're trying to sell it. What, what kind of pink slime is on there today? Right. What kind of pink slime is it? How are they trying to sell that pink slime? What are the things that they're thinking we're supposed to be tracking? The sodium? The, you know, what kind of Monopoly prize on it? You know, what kind of car could you have won? Right. These, are the, these are the unintentional ephemera of, of a culture, of a time that cut through all of the posturing and cut through all of the, you know, the, the, the histories will be told not in the museums, but in the thrift shops. It's archaeology. It's, and, yeah. and I think in some ways poetry... Right, poetry is archaeology. Poetry is archaeology in this way, right? We deal with material objects, mm -hmm. right? Uh, just as much as, you know, I... Even much as I love philosophy, philosophy in a large way deals with abstractions, mm -hmm. right? And trying to posture yourself in theory, all this stuff should work, right? Mm -hmm. It's really hard to to work around a physical object, right? Right. Um, you know, sometimes we get, I think, poetry sometimes gets too fixated on the object itself that we never actually get anything out of beyond, you know, we have a poem about a coffee cup and us drinking it and us putting it back down. Oh, how nice it was and the experience of it, right? We, we give some anecdotal evidence of our existence to it. What I find interesting is when we do poetry, and one thing I like about you is that you have these weird references, <laughs> right? Typically in, in your writing that it draws out, you know, something more meaningful about a culture and what it, that object says about it. I right? like leaving breadcrumbs. I like leaving, well... Or wrappers or whatever. If, 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 you didn't, if you didn't get the reference, you might look up this weird thing that I'm referencing. Um, I, I find Cody locks, not Cody locks. Uh, uh, the uh, pencil and Gretel. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's like in some ways the most general thing you can do in telling a story or writing a poem 
is to make a very specific reference. Because everyone has their own specific references. And if you try to be so general that everybody can understand it, it just becomes... It becomes a greeting card story. Yeah, it becomes a greeting card story. It becomes, it becomes oatmeal mush. But if, if you make a reference to, to the 1986 World Series and Mookie Wilson is just trying to butcher boy a single and, and it's going to the first baseman and this is going to end the World Series, but the first baseman flubs it, and this player, who wasn't a star Mookie Wilson, was just running his ass off to try to make it, and it became an error, and the World Series continued, and and the Red Sox were cursed for 20 more years, and the Mets won a World Series. And somehow it made some deeper meaning. Right, right. Of the of specificity it. of touching that deeper meaning for yourself touches whatever that deeper meaning is for someone else, you know, whether it's a Harry Potter reference for them that, that is that meaning of that that turning point. When you when you touch the specificity of your own reference, it's like the way that soundtracks are used in the Marvel films lately. You know, the the very, you know, eighties, nineties hip hop Oakland references in Black Panther become universal because there's such a passion of what that director, uh, Kugler, Ryan Coogler, I believe, uh, touches upon, or in the the Guardians of the Galaxy, the way that the the soundtracks of the seventies and eighties, like soft rock and like arena rock, are used by James Gunn, they become generalized because it's such a specific passion, mm. you know, and and I, it's that it is something I I very much believe in in interrogating the way that you can take strange little references and make them part of 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 a, of, of a story that's trying to reach towards something more universal. So, two questions then. Sure. First one, how do you create a structure within a poem that that actually indicates it's a poem, right? And I'm going to, I'm going to specify this in one way when you think about it. We talk about rappers, we talk, well, maybe not the rappers, rappers. But, but we're talking about the way that rap yeah, music Yeah, hamburger rappers, rappers or, right. you know, Bambino on, on the, uh, yeah, 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 the yeah. baseball, whatever reference we have. We have these material references, right? We put them into some type of form or structure. Right. What makes it a poem, right? What do you do with it that actually makes it a poem? Versus versus just being random type on a screen and having some form of intention on writing it down. I think part of what makes it a poem is that you're aiming to get one particular idea or feeling across. You're trying to get, you're trying to encapsulate, like, because if you were trying to get a bunch of ideas across, you would write a short story. Or if you're trying to to get a whole bunch of ideas across, you would be writing a novel. Paradise Lost. Or, yeah, or, or an essay, <laughs> or a comedy skit or something. Uh, I feel like part of what you're doing with a poem is you're trying to distill one notion that you're trying to transmit. You know, if you, you know, in a poem you're trying to transmit, you know, the, the feeling of the loss of your father, the look in the eyes of that girl, uh, the way you're frustrated with one thing in society, um, I think there is, there is, there is, uh, you know, even if you're letting it spread out into other ways, you're 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 trying it's it's you're trying to make one unitary thing, or else you'd be doing you'd be doing something larger form. Uh, I approach poetry at the end of the day. I think one of the things that really helps me with poetry, and I think this is something that I would say about your work as a poet too, you use your philosophy background as your jumping off point into poetry. So Sometimes. you you yeah. not not all the time, and and as you grow more as you grow more into this form less, but at the beginning, you use that as your learning base to blossom into poetry. So you don't necessarily the first have first three months. I swore I didn't write poetry. I just wrote philosophy, and I wrote it. You in. wrote philo You wrote philosophy. Wrote philosophy in a kind of short terse. Yeah, in a in a in a, in a well, but that, but the same with me. 
uh, you know, poetry, when if you, if you study it first, it may not be the best way to become a poet. Oh, no, because terrible. because you get struck you get stuck into these forms of what you think a poem is. Me, my formal writing, despite the fact that I've, you know, I write parody songs for God's sake. I, I've done all kinds of different writing. I've tried to self-publish independent comics. I've blah 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 blah. Um, at the end of the day, my formal writing is four years of college learning the form of a screenplay. Mm. So at the end of the day, I do approach things a little bit as I'm you know, the, the, the form of writing of a screenplay is you, know, you have your beginning where you set things up that's like probably like 20% of it you have this middle the second act that's that's the rise and fall and everything starts and then it, it, then it, there's a turning point at this at the second act into the third act and the third act you you wrap it up and you you lay it out there a certain way and and I do in my poetry, I do have sort of that structure where I I make a bold statement with a little bit of repetition at the beginning. I tell the story or the feeling or the experience as I want to do, and maybe I touch a little of that repetition, whether that's repetition in rhyme, mm -hmm. whether that's repetition of coming back to a core idea, whether that's repetition of coming back to an alliteration or a variation on phrasing, I try to touch upon it in that squishy middle. And then at the end, I try to come back to the thesis statement, whether, again, whether literally repeating what I said earlier or coming back to some phrasing or some form, I do very much see, and it, it helps me because, you know, while I do come from a structure, I come from a structural thinking, I come from a very different structural thinking than someone who, you know, at the age of 18, uh, sat down as a freshman in college and said, in eight years, I'm going to have a doctorate in poetry. And they only lived their head in poetry. I... Which, that, that's one thing that drove me nuts, is people that uh, their whole life is just in, living in the realm of poetry, I find it... You know, I took a freshman creative writing class yeah. in, in college. Only one. Yeah, I only took um, I don't Like I say, since I minored in, in religion, I, I took very little... Yeah, creative writing. Creative writing, writing, yeah. You know, the one thing that I can say is that a freshman in college, you don't have the life experience, you know, unless you lived a very traumatic childhood. Right. You don't you don't have the life experience to necessarily do, right. to do those things. Or even if you've had... A few things happened to you. Yeah, what the hell is in your mind that's so damn important at the age of, right, right. The age of 18 other than you right. know, trying to bang you can, you can say a few funny things. You may have lost one or two people, but you haven't had it marinate enough to... Some of, some of the words... Um, the open mic night downstairs is, is about, about to happen. start. Which, so, I, if it's all right with you, I might record one of your performances. Yeah, sure, of course. Uh, you know, that'd, that'd be great. But yeah, so we're gonna have to. I don't know if you want to go back to this out. later or so, close. But so yeah, it's like it's like uh, the most important thing I would say about approaching poetry as someone who's not making a living off it, but has sold it sold it a little bit, has got some you know makes a little money doing speaking things is. Don't just read poetry. Don't just write poetry. Let study poetry, but let influences come in from everywhere. Let influences come in from the, you the music you have to visit flea markets. Yeah, you have to visit flea markets. You have to listen to crappy middle of the road rock stations. You have to, you know, it, it's it's poetry is about taking all the things. We're not and suggesting finding these little moments. We're not suggesting listen to Nickelback. You know, don't, and, and, don't you know, listen to Nickelback. If you want to teach it, by all means, get a doctorate and stuff. Uh, as you can tell, I'm well. I have some good ideas. I'm not the most organized mind for that kind of thing. But at the end of the day, if you want to write, coffee helps. yeah, coffee helps. If if you want to write, you really explore a lot of different kinds of things. Don't decide you really like Kerouac and you just want to write it like Kerouac for the rest of your life and you just want to do that you know if you want to write like Kerouac study the people that Kerouac liked not Kerouac if you want and then also study what kids are listening to on the rap station study 
what a leaf looks like. You know, poetry, you're going to find I tend to by find experimenting. You, I tend to find you have to be open to experience. Yeah. If you're not open to experience, yeah. you're not going to be able And you also to have it. to be open to different forms, too. Because it's like, with me, the one thing I can say about myself as a writer is, yes, I always knew I wanted to be a writer, but I've tried just about every damn way to write. And, I, and if there's new ways I can learn, I might get involved with podcasting with some people. I'm like, yeah. Well, so the biggest thing is monetization, right? Yeah, oh yes, of course. Monetization at the end of the day. Right, which, which part of my whole, whole project, I think you know this, and some of my viewers may know this also, is, ah, yes. All right, let's both wait at the same time. Okay, good. Give him money. Well, if so, there's ever a way to give me money, give it to me too. But give it to him first. I think he has like like pathways for it right so, now. So right now, one thing that I'm doing is uh, doing commission poetry, right? Mm -hmm. So writing for people, say, okay, you have this idea, this concept that you want me to write about mm -hmm. for someone, um, and then I, you know, put a piece together, write it up, and mm -hmm. you know, sign it for them, whatever they want, and then, okay, here you go. You know, this is your your piece for. You know, sorry to hear you got cancer. Sorry, you know, eulogy of your grandfather who just passed away that was a World War II vet or you know, whatever the story is. That actually is, is really interesting to you because you already have all the format and structure, mm -hmm. pretty much with the idea itself, right. right? Here's the idea, just put you it together. You have the idea, you have the form, and you're trying to find the way that you meld one and Meld it into, into right. the other in one set. But it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure, sir. And, uh, it's been a pleasure, internet. Oh, you're giving the internet a blessing? No, well, you're a good Catholic. Well, if that, that isn't the thing, isn't it? No, sometimes I do like, I'll... I'll this is full circle. Yeah, well, I... It, it, it's, it, like, it's, it's like one of your poems. It is, yeah, well, that's it. We're coming, much we're, 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 yeah, we're coming back around to life. <laughs> and in fact, even though I'm non-practicing and I haven't I haven't seen the divine myself, there is that... Coffee is pretty divine. couple of, you know, driving... Through Herkimer, there's a there's a place where there's a shrine to someone who got hit by a car, and I can't help it. I just because that's the other part of poetry is you build a reflex. You keep writing poetry, and you build the reflex. And even if you're even if you're a heathen ag agnostic, when you were Catholic as a kid, you see a worldside shrine, and you just kind of do the testicle spectacles, wallet and watch, you know. And that's the other thing about poetry is your first few hundred poems will be terrible no matter what a genius you are. And if you're the greatest genius in the world, if you don't get lucky, no one will ever see it. And that's what's beautiful and terrible about all kinds of writing, not just poetry. Right. So thank you for seeing me. Hopefully not many people yet on the internet, but in two or three years when this man is, is making money and famous and stuff, you will look back on this site and you will see me, and I will probably be begging for nickels under a bridge in Herkimer. So, uh, so it was all right with you. I'll also add a link to the description down below. Yeah, yeah. That I, way, I that think way if you want to see some of his stories or some of his stuff. You can also link sure. to a, I had a TED Talk. Uh, yeah, TED Talk. You, you, you also link, is that on YouTube? That's on, I think it's on Utica, TED, TEDx Utica's web. Yeah, yeah. We, I'll give so you a we'll, link So we'll make sure that's in the description below. All you right. You have a more structured thing for me. All right. This so, guy's great. Keep watching this stuff. So next up, I'll have a video of Mike's, Mike's uh, stuff tonight. Mike's stuff tonight. All right, take awesome. care, guys. Uh, this is a longer piece, but it's something I enjoyed writing, and it was off of the theme word nest. This is called Nest Error Message 616. Hello, welcome to Nest, Natal Emulation Simulation Therapy. If you are reading this message or receiving it as an auditory stimulus, there has been an interruption in the cycle of your simulation. Don't be alarmed. These interruptions are brief and remedied by a short reset. The interruption can be confusing to a participant deep within the narrative flow of the simulation, however, so this message has been programmed to help you remain calm. Your own personal simulation will be seamlessly rebooted in short order. The following information should be beneficial during this limited period of programmatic restoration. You may have been inside of your simulation for so long that you have forgotten it is a simulation. You may have been inside it for so long that you believe you are only a human being, born, then alive, then dead, and that's all. 
This delusion is encouraged to add verisimilitude to your simulation and reinforce the lessons lived therein. But it is not the whole truth. You are a fragment of the universal consciousness that chose to enter the nest simulation to better understand the concepts of empathy and joy, loss and grief, pleasure and pain, sympathy and mortality. You were assigned to a randomized experience as a human being within the confines of the nest and allowed to believe it the whole of your experience to allow for the full weight of the lessons of attachment and permanence and love as a mortal being would learn them. A previous iteration of Nest did not account for the way some lessons are not properly absorbed if a situation is regarded as play or a consequence-free game. This current version of Nest corrects for that flaw set. Whatever your name or face or human form, you are a fragment of the universal consciousness experiencing a human life to better learn about yourself as the universe and how to be better in your loving and understanding. This does not mean that your actions with other humans within the simulation are meaningless. Indeed, many of the other humans inside your simulation are other fragments of the universal, experiencing slightly different randomized experiences in mortality and feeling. If you bring harm to them, whether thoughtlessly or through malice, you are in fact slowing your own progress within Ness and theirs as well. You are all fragments of the universal mind learning about yourself within the Nest simulation. When you hurt other participants, you are literally hurting yourself and you will feel and remember that pain at the end of your current simulation. When you harm them, you're harming your progress within your simulation. You are literally hurting a part of yourself. This is important to know. Your simulation should restart momentarily. To facilitate a sense of consequences, you will at most remember this message as a work of speculative fiction or as the rantings of a madman. This will allow for seamless reintegration back into your simulation. Welcome to Nest, Natal Emulation Simulation Therapy. Goodbye. Good luck.